Hi, Paul Coker here from OneBloodyDrop.com. This morning I'm at the Bristol Royal Infirmary and I'm talking with Dr. Rob Andrews about diabetes and exercise. In this short video, we're going to be talking about how to manage type 1 diabetes during high intensity interval training. Uh, Dr. Andrews, it's very kind of you to join us and you are a diabetologist specializing in sports and diabetes and you have a uh, a list of patients which includes elite athletes and Olympians so your your knowledge is incredible on diabetes and sport and I'm learning so much from you this morning and uh, I can't thank you enough for joining us uh, in this video I want to ask you the question how do you manage or what do the guidelines tell us about managing diabetes during high interval intensity training and what is HIT? So HIT to high intensity interval training is is a period when you you have all out intensity, so you're going as hard as you can for a very brief period of time, and you do that a number of times. And the length of that can vary. Sometimes it can be from 30 seconds to two minutes of that all out intensity. And on the whole, you don't do that more than 10 times. It's really difficult to do it much more than, than 10 times. So you're doing an all out and then backing off, doing all out, and then backing off and doing all out and then backing off. And it's become quite trendy because people see that it's a short amount of exercise that you do. So in, a, in all our busy lifestyle, um, it could be helpful in, in, in making people uh, continue to do exercise regularly. Um, it's not quite as, as it's sold because actually the time interval is much the same as you have to do a warm up before you do the sprints and you have to do a warm down afterwards. So actually you still are going to have to spend about 30 minutes doing it. Um, um, but there is evidence that, that that benefit is as good as doing 60 minutes of exercise. So that's the reason why people are doing it. Okay. So, um, from my understanding of diabetes, if you suddenly work at a high intensity rate, then you're going to have a number of hormones that fly around the system that are going to make you insulin resistant. Um, am I right in thinking that that's going to happen in high intensity interval training? Yes, so when, when you do the high intensity uh, training the blood sugars tend to go up. Um, okay. They Surprisingly, so we, we just finished a, a trial doing this, they don't rocket as, as much as we expected them to rocket. Um, and I guess because what what happens is is that actually you're kind of ready for the fact that you are going to, to as it were, be hurt during the thing and, and that dampens down the response. We haven't got the hormones back from it, but, but it's, it, it's not as much of a rise as we'd expect to be. So it goes up a bit and then kind of flatlines. It doesn't just keep climbing when they're, when they're doing the event. Okay, so that will have an impact on how you manage your diabetes before you do high intensity interval training, I guess. Yeah, so it's a bit like the anaerobic uh, exercise that we're talking about. We, we try and say to people, um, you don't need to generally make an adaption with your insulins before. Um, and if you've got a blood sugar around five to six, then we're happy as long as the direction isn't falling for you to start. You don't have to prop it up as high as seven before you start because it's not going to fall. Okay, so um, essentially if, if people look at the video that we've created on how to manage your type 1 diabetes in anaerobic exercise then the principles would be similar to how you manage for high intensity interval training yep um yeah pre pretty similar interestingly although you think that you that, that you probably have burnt lots of calories you don't burn very many calories with the high intensity training because it's because you think about it so for some of them it's you've only actually trained for five minutes so you don't completely deplete all of your glycogen levels in your muscles and you don't complete, your, it, it complete as much. So actually, although you can be high after the exercise, your hyper risk is less. Okay, so there could actually be some benefit here. Yeah, and that's what we're exploring. It seems to be the, the one that, that has the least kind of problems for people with, with type 1 and, diabetes. And um, I, I know from doing aerobic exercise that I have an increased insulin sensitivity after aerobic exercise. Would I expect the same if I did high intensity interval training? You do get a, an increase in insulin sensitivity but it's, it, it's not as much as if, you've, if, you've, if you have done a, a bout of weights that you've done a number of sessions and you've done a number of parts. 
Um, because the, the other thing about HIIT, if you think about it, is it tends to be one muscle group that you're training. So you're doing it on a bike, so you're just training your, your legs or your... It, um, the people who get very instant sensitized are the swimmers, if they're doing HIIT, just that, you know, they go and do some sprints, then of course they're using lots of muscle groups. So again, they'll get very instant sensitized. The other thing that's really interesting about it, which we need to do much more work, is that there are there's a group of people who have type 1 diabetes that lose their, their, their feeling when their glucose falls, so something called hypo-unaware. And it appears that if people do HIIT training, that returns it. Um, certainly in the animal models it does, and, and there's a, a, been a, a very small trial that has looked at that and seems to indicate that, so there's a bigger trial going on to try and confirm that. Well, that's, that's really interesting. You know, I, I've lived with type 1 diabetes for 40 years and I've had episodes where I've been very hypo unaware and I've managed to recover my hypo awareness through uh, good management and using a CGM. Um, but to have another tool, uh, an exercise that I could do that would uh, encourage me to be more hypo aware would be incredible. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps I need to ha add some hit to my uh, training. training mm -hmm. People who do it swear by it. <laughs> And um, in the previous videos, we, we created th three short videos, but I think in this one we'll, we'll just roll through and, and, and do one because I think there's a lot of crossover between this and the anaerobic exercise yeah. that we were talking about. So we, we've spoken about managing before, uh, managing type 1 diabetes before HIT. Um, are, there, are there any changes that I would need to make whilst I'm doing high intensity interval training? I'm guessing not because it's a short duration. No, you do t tend not to have to do uh, anything during during the event. It, as you say, it's very it's very short, and post you don't tend to have to do that because because unless it's your own program that you've made up, anything that you do in the gym or you you tend to do hit with people. It's kind of a very social kind of thing that you, that you do together, and people seem to enjoy seeing the suffering of other people suffering with you. Um, but there's always a, a bit of warm down that's built into the in, into those programs if you're doing it at a gym, and that warm down helps bring down the blood sugar. Excellent. So um, I would expect to see some increased insulin sensitivity after I've done yeah. a hit session. Do I need to be worried about um, glucose loading to prevent a hypo in the hours after a HIIT session? So we always err on the caution side. We always recommend people err on the caution side. So the first you know, times that you're doing it um, is, is treated as you would treat an anaerobic. So, so, so make sure you have nutrition on the water. Make sure that you change, reduce your, um, your insulin dosages. And if it's the first time you've gone to a HIIT session, particularly if you've done it after four o'clock in the afternoon, then you need to wake up and check your blood sugars in the morning and then learn from that experience and, and, and see what happens. The experience in, in the trials that we've done where we've exposed people to it for three to six months is, is that actually they, they find that, that that risk is really quite low overnight of, of having low blood sugars. Excellent. So um, perhaps it's the... Uh the golden exercise for those of us with type 1 diabetes in terms of managing our blood glucose levels and without having a big risk of hyperglycemia? Yeah, we think it might be because the, 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 the trouble that we've had with, with, with selling the idea to, of exercise for type 1 diabetes to, to healthcare workers in the field is that the trials haven't shown that if someone exercises regularly that it affects their HbA1c, so their overall control. Because, they, because of the problems they have after exercise, they have this variance of high and lows. And because they're worried about the lows, they tend to slightly prop up them. What we found is with the continuous glucose monitors after HIT, actually the time in your target is better. So again, it might be one of these things that if we do in trials, we'll show that actually exercise is good for, you, good for lowering the HbA1c, which will really sell it to the healthcare workers who really concentrate on HbA1c. It, it, I know it's not the subject of this video, but actually that's something I've been irritated by over the years as somebody who's been doing sport, that HbA1c is the holy grail in healthcare. And yes, I understand that my HbA1c is phenomenally important and that reducing my HbA1c by 10% has a huge impact on reducing my risk of long-term complications and, and the um, Diabetes Control and Complications trial back in 1992 showed us that and has been supported ever since. But my, my health is more than my HbA1c. Um, I, I have this philosophy that I want to maintain a good HbA1c and I, I work in old numbers. My HbA1c right now is 6.9. Okay, room for improvement, but not terrible. But 
it's also about other health factors as well. I can't just look at my HbA1c and say, ah, oh, Mr. Coker, that's your health. I think that there's you, you need to look at things like blood pressure and heart rate and cholesterol, and I think all of these things are actually positively impacted by exercise. So even if my HbA1c may be a little higher because of supporting a, a slightly higher blood glucose level because I don't want a nocturnal hypo, I think that I could argue that some of the effects of exercise actually counteract the effects of a slightly elevated HbA1c. Yeah, I think you've made a really important point there. I mean, I think uh, there are three things that seem to be important for, for, for diabetes. Um, it's, it's lipid control, so getting the, the fats down in your blood. It's blood pressure control, and it's glucose control, so your HbA1c. And the, the evidence from all the trials is that blood pressure is, is, is double as good as the others. Yeah. So it's because it prevents both the big micro, macrovascular complications, so heart attacks, strokes, and the microvascular complications, which are the eye and the kidneys and the, and the feet. Um, and to be honest, it's a bit like the meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad. If you can get two perfect, then actually it trumps the third not being perfect. And that comes across very clearly in exercise. Exercise gets the blood pressure much, much, much better than anything and gets the lipids much, much, much better than anything else. Um, and the other thing that it does is it reduces... A, your risk of, of cancer by a third, uh, reduces your risk of getting depression or, or, or dementia by a third. Um, and recent studies have shown that, that it, it, it gives you added up life years. Um, and the most recent evidence from prospector trials, not a randomized control trial, because it's much more difficult to do, is that people who exercise regularly with diabetes get less microvascular complications. So actually exercising is the way to go with type 1 diabetes and even if the HbA1c is not perfect you've protected the other two. I'm pleased that my own personal philosophy aligns with the research. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks Dr Andrews. Um, in the next video we're going to be talking about how to manage diabetes during mixed mode sports, things like football and rugby where you might have a, a sudden spurt of speed and, and then a, a period where you're less active followed by another spurt of speed and I think that that will present some different challenges in managing type 1 diabetes. So we'll see you on the next video. Thank you. Thank you.